Fala Funo Misha, fala Biljana na pozivu. Uh, this is as much as it goes for my Serbian. I could have done this in Serbian if I prepared a text and read it, but I'd rather speak to you. But thank you very much uh, for the invitation to this, uh, to this event. Thank you very much to the Belgrade Institute for European Studies and the Center for Migration Studies for organizing this conference. Uh, the topic of international relations in the post-COVID world is extremely relevant and timely, and I think international relations are indeed impacted by this pandemic. As other panelists uh, will give an analysis of the COVID effects on uh, specific regional areas, uh, I saw you mentioned all of them, but we will be discussing about United States, uh, the Latin American region, Russia, European Union. So I will get not, not too much into the details of those regions, but I'll try to give you a broader picture on the role of multilateralism. And I'm glad that the op-ed we produced in March has generated interest. Uh, thank you very much, Biljana, for uh, paying attention to it. Uh, here I will just limit myself to present a few points, uh, and I understand that the translation in Serbian was already distributed and is available, and you can make use of it. But before I start, I would like to make a preamble. Uh, this conference is called International Relations in the Age of Corona. And uh, as we are still in many countries, Bidiana is in New York now, and we are still in, in the emergency phase of COVID-19, I think it would be very difficult uh, to make predictions on how the post-COVID world will look like. I think anybody uh, in this world today who will try to make an assessment of what it will look like in a few months' time is either a visionary or will be proven wrong by facts. Uh, the reality is that none of us, uh, from uh, analysts like us uh, to the biggest leaders, uh, have a clue of what can come up. So we deal with day-to-day -day situations and try to to uh, deal with the situation based on the few information that we have available. So, therefore, uh, I uh, say, whatever I will say today, I uh, use this caveat that uh, I might be proven wrong tomorrow. So, uh, I, I just offer to some thoughts based on the current trends and the dynamics to try to understand what the, the geopolitical component of the coronavirus is. Um, now, uh, since uh, COVID-19 crisis uh, um, exploded, we've witnessed uh, two types of trends, both on the international and domestic political arena. Internationally, uh, countries are becoming more inward-looking, uh, nationalistic, and developing uh, protectionist policies. I think this is very natural. Uh, uh, whenever you are attacked, you become more self-defensive. I don't have to tell you in Belgrade what it looks like when you are attacked from outside. You, of course, become more inward-looking. This is very human. It's uh, in the human nature. When we are in danger, we become self-protective. Uh, Thomas Hobbes uh, spoke about uh, homo homini lupus. No, a man is wolf to the other man. So if you are attacked externally, you try to make sure that you are safeguarded. Uh, the Roman Catholic Pope, uh, Francis, uh, said that the biggest virus of humanity is uh, selfishness and difference. I think uh, this is uh, very true. I think the biggest uh, danger that we run the risk of is being very selfish. Uh, domestically, uh, we've seen a lot of concentration of powers in the executives. Uh, this is probably um, normal and physiological. In a moment of danger, governments have to take more power and there is less control of uh, the parliamentary component. Although as Secretary General of the Parliamentary Assembly, I very much will talk later on about how important it is that, that, that there is parliamentary control on the executives. But it was was inevitable that executives uh, introduced the state of emergencies in some places. It's important that the state of emergencies are limited in time and, of course, not used to justify an increase of power. Moreover, the corona crisis has hit the world at a time when the entire international system and its balance of power had already showing increasing sign of weakness. Uh, with constantly rising tension, shrinking trust and a degree of international cooperation fatigue. COVID is simply exacerbating these pre-existing weaknesses, and, and uh, this is the main dynamic that can be observed. Solidarity between nations, it's uh, too much of an exception rather than the rule, and we know how much important is uh, cooperation in this moment. Uh, we've seen the debate within the European Union, and I know that uh, Dr. Mil uh, Milan Negrutinovic will talk about that, but uh, the debate in the European Union uh, between member states on the economic uh, recovery programs, uh, where mutual distrust and blame games are growing and uh, threatening the very existence of the Union. 
existing agreements on common challenges are being um, also questioned. Uh, we've seen uh, the persistent stalemate on the migrants and refugee crisis, or the US announced the withdrawal from the Open Skies Treaty. And I'm sure Bidiana will touch upon that. Economic protectionism is on the rise, and the sharing of medical research, now more important than ever, is embryonic. Trust in international organizations, and this is a point which is very much at my heart, is shrinking with the United States accusing them of unduly taking sides. See, for instance, the case of the US and the World Health Organization polemic, or in crisis, I'd rather say. Geopolitical tensions are somehow uh, getting sharper. Take the instance of the renewed oil competition, US-China relations, including uh, on situation in Taiwan and Hong Kong, and the recent developments uh, in the Middle East. So, all of this to say what? Are we growing towards uh, wars, conflicts? Hopefully not, and probably not. Surely we are at a crossroad, but actually I think that this trend can be well reverted and it can be an opportunity, this corona crisis, uh, can be a positive turning point for international relations. But there has to be a clear and conscious decision of choosing cooperation as opposed to confrontation. Uh, dear friends, the reality that we have learned from this crisis is that a global uh, problem like COVID requires global responses. And this is valid for all the global challenges that we have. Uh, we have uh, challenges in this world about uh, uh, the uh, uh, fight against terrorism, movement of people, climate change, the health crisis. Now, all these challenges can only be won if we put all our assets together and collaborate more than compete against each other. We need long-term strategic responses, and this must be coordinated among the states. If states act independently, we will not get out of this nightmare. Uh, states uh, seek self-interest, but today self-interest, and this is the paradox, today the self-interest coincides with maintaining a strong international system. So this means an effective uh, working re international legal system where check and balances are in place and treaties, conventions and agreements are fully implemented. Perfect information, which means full exchange between countries, and zero transaction costs, which means that such exchanges are not subject to a price, be it financially or power related. I don't know how international relations will look uh, like in a few years, but I know that if we want to preserve and fix uh, the current system, we need to rebuild trust and confidence. Uh, poverenia, you would say, in, uh, in Serbian. I mean, poverenia is really the uh, currency we mostly need, and uh, trust is the only effective recipe. But to this end, international organizations play a very important role. However, these international organizations, and I've been a member of international organizations in Serbia, in Kosovo, in Bosnia, and other places, they can only work uh, properly if the states uh, who make these international organizations agree that they are important and give them the conditions uh, to provide their added value. So joint positive decision will create a virtual circle generating more trust among states and more productive cooperation for the benefit of the whole international community. So international organizations can work if, of course, states give them the power to work, but also if the individuals who enter into these international organizations then work in this international organization with the spirit of not serving the interest of one country, but serving the interest of the many who belong into that international organization. Now, as a, a Secretary General of the OSCPA, I also am very proud to say that uh, it's immediately after the uh, crisis uh, started, we have tried to adapt our work uh, to the new circumstances, uh, acknowledging the importance of maintaining a live the political debate in the international level. And uh, uh, this assembly, which is 57 countries, uh, 323 members of parliament uh, from 1 billion, uh, representing 1 billion citizens from Vancouver and Vladivostok, has tried to maintain alive uh, this dialogue. Uh, uh, probably you've seen we've launched a, a series of uh, webinars or conferences similar to the one we're having today on all our issues, traditional issues, uh, conflicts uh, in the OECPA. We did a lot about uh, the conflicts in, you know, Caucasus, in Ukraine, uh, in uh, Transnistria, also the post-conflict areas like Southeast Europe. We've uh, been having webinars on human rights. Uh, we've talked about the economy and the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the economy. And of course, the role of parliaments and the importance of uh, parliaments and 
have uh, in this situation. Uh, parliaments in every country have uh, three main assets, uh, proposing legislation, ensuring effective oversight of the executive, and representing the citizen. And our role here in the OSCP is to ensure that these three assets are reflected also and amplified on the wider international level. I think in order to achieve all of this, we need strong leadership. And I'm sure I'm talking to uh, individuals there who know what I'm talking about. When I talk about strong leadership, I mean adult uh, leadership. Uh, leaders capable of indicating a strategy, presenting a narrative which is detached from the day-to-day hourly check of our web, uh, you know, uh, social media or our polls or our statistics or detached from the electoral cycle. You need leaders who are capable of saying this is the way forward and not indicating the way forward only looking at how many likes I have on my Facebook account or on my Twitter account or uh, how am I doing in the polls in view of the next. Uh, next electoral cycle. If leaders keep on focusing on what is the mood of uh, their constituency at that very moment in time, they will not be able to present a future vision. And uh, what we need in these challenges that we have, as I said, health, crisis, climate change, um, the issues of movement of people, uh, fighting terrorism, we need um, plans and strategies we are, which are very long term and uh, which go beyond one electoral cycle and which uh, might be making you pay a price in one election or the other, because the proposals that you make maybe are not of the liking of your electorate in that very moment in time, but maybe they are the best solutions for the future. So you need also leaders, adult leaders who are courageous also enough to propose leadership. Basically, you need politics with a capital P. Maybe you need uh, politicians who are courageous of making and taking decisions with a strategic view for the future. Um, once again, uh, a world that needs a revived and effective multilateral system to sustain it. Uh, we need a world that rejects uh, the principle of the dichotomy amicus hostis, uh, friends, enemy, us and them. I think the only way we can work uh, in this world, and uh, COVID-19 has taught us this, is that we must cooperate. If every country deals by itself, uh, within itself, and doesn't care about what happens outside its border, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, very short-sighted and you don't go very far with this kind of strategy. So at the end of the day, what is really needed is uh, um, political will. <laughs> but uh, this is uh, the, another big currency besides uh, uh, Poverenia that I said at the beginning, you know, you need the trust. Uh, in order to create political will, I do not know what is the recipe. Uh, you know, we are in this parliamentary assembly dealing with many leaders, with many conflicts, and we always say these problems will be solved once there is the political will of that leader or the other leader to make such and such thing. But I do not know what is the formula to uh, create political will. Some say uh, you can use sanctions, and again, I'm talking to people who know exactly what sanctions means, but I don't know if sanctions have materialized the political will in your part of the world. So is the sanctions the, the, uh, uh, the instrument to create political will? Is uh, threats, is it uh, naming and shaming a country in the public arena? This creates political will. In the OSCP, I think we offer a recipe called dialogue. Uh, dialogue among equal countries. And dialogue based on the full respect of the other uh, person. Uh, it's very important that when you want to have a dialogue with somebody, you uh, try to treat your interlocutor with respect. If you engage in dialogue with the intellectual arrogance of thinking, well, I know better, I know what you need, so you just have to do what I'm going to tell you, that interlocutor will not engage with you in a dialogue. And I, I, am, uh, I have been for many years in, in, in the Balkans. I have engaged in many discussions with mayors, prime ministers, presidents. And I think the success of uh, the work that I had in that region was always because the interlocutor understood that I was not trying to come there with a recipe uh, of an arrogant intellectual uh, uh, international actor tried to tell them what they need to do. But I was understanding their reasons and trying to work together with them, showing maximum respect and working with them to find solutions. So this is for now, I think. It's a few highlights from uh, my, um, I mean, the gist of what I had in this uh, op-ed, but uh, looking forward for the discussion and maybe take some questions later on. Thank you very much, Misha and Tigan.